Hey and welcome to this tutorial on how you can model the mechanical behavior of soft polymer foams. Um, so these are foams that are really soft and squishy and not the, the brittle materials that sometimes are used as well. Um, so those are sort of just some examples of these type of what I call hyper foam type material models. They're very nice for foams often and people are pretty familiar with this. What I want to do next is just to take a look at this with real data, real experimental data. So let's let's take a look at some data that I have here. I'm going to open my file, experimental data, maximize my window. So here's data for a specific soft polymer foam. And it was tested, I'm going to test the video, we did nine tests here, four in tension and four in compression, and one was a confined compression. So this curve here is confined compression. So what's confined compression? Whereas you take a block of the foam and you confine one side from deforming sideways. So you compress this, the foam will move in the other direction, but not in the confined direction. So it, it's a slightly stiffer response typically in confined compression. Um, so this is the data that we got on this foam. And the first thing we look at when we see this data is, huh, this looks kind of weird or interesting. Um, we'll see particularly that the, the, the slope here in tension, the Young's modulus, the small strain tension, is not exactly the same as in compression. There's a little bit of an asymmetry there. And um, if you think through this, you will realize that the, any of these foam models that I just talked about, none of them can do that. That's not a capability that comes with those models. Um, so that may cause us a little bit of a trouble uh, uh, because of that. Um, the other thing when you should think about when you look at foam data like this, or any data for any material for that matter, is, well, is this enough data to calibrate one of these hyperfoam type material models? A hyperfoam model is based basically on the Ogden energy function, and that's perhaps you're more familiar with that. And the, the rule of thumb is there, you need to have at least two, preferably three different loading modes of data in order to calibrate the model. Otherwise, you will not have a unique set of parameters. So here we have universal tension, we have compression, we have confined compression. So one could argue that this is perhaps the minimum number of tests that you need for calibrating such a model. I would prefer if I also had either shear or a biaxial loading on this foam as well, because I think that would be even better. I would probably prefer uh, one of those to really understand the response. But say this is what we have, and we're going to try to work with this data. Um, so how would we do that? Well, we can just uh, select the material model. So set, select material model. Let's scroll down to, let's do the ANSYS Ogden foam. Um, I'll do two parameters in this, no two terms. And here are the values that, that M calibration gives us. Uh, before we start manipulating these, it's always useful to, uh, I guess, to do two things. First, I'm going to save it as a new file, and then I'm going to look at the data in more carefully. So if I open one of these, it's always good to look at what kind of data we have. So I clicked on Control w to, that brings me over to the, the data manipulation side. You can see that this has 2,500 data points, which is absolutely uh, too many. It's not necessary to have so many data points to represent such a simple curve. So you can change the number of data points here by, that will just make the calibration run quicker. So I did that. Once you have manipulated this, you want to save the new set to the load case. And now this one has 2, 500 data points. Um, and I can repeat that for all of these, I believe. If I select these and click on the edit, and I'll say, Set minimum a number of data points. Um, oh, I guess this one. Make sure no data file has more than 500 is what we're going to pick here. Uh, so there we go. And uh, it will fix these for us. And uh, now what we should do is we can start thinking about uh, these parameters here. So beta parameters are related to the um, Poisson's ratio. A beta of 0 0.1, I know, is uh, gives a Poisson's ratio of around 0 0.15. So I keep that here. But on the other hand, um, we have 
information about the confined compression. So maybe we should let the software search for these. I'm going to lock these two parameters to be the same though, 55, 55, some number, it's the same number, so these two parameters are now locked to be the same. Um, I'm going to search for all of these four. I want alpha, uh, I want uh, alpha 2 to be negative, so I'm going to make that minus 2, I make this positive 2, I make this minus 1, so we have the ne negative, negative. I run this once, and we'll see that this is the prediction here. I'm going to hide the legend because it's so big. See, the stiffness, the predicted stiffness is too high, so the dot, dotted line here with the prediction. So we're going to make these 10 times smaller, 0 0.1, minus 0 0.1. Here it is. It's still too stiff, so we'll make this uh, even smaller, 0 0.05, minus 0 0.05, run it again. Uh, and now we're starting to see, okay, that's too, see the problem, right? In tension, this model is too soft, and compression is too stiff. So we may not be able to fully calibrate the model to this, that works really well. Um, but we can try. So if I try this now, I'm going to just run the calibration from here. When I say run calibration, uh, we have a number of different methods we can use to find these parameters. I, I purposely set these parameters in a way that I thought would make sense. They're not right values yet, but they're relatively close. But I like the software to, uh, as it searches for these parameters, take a small steps from this point in, in order of, uh, of optimizing the parameters. So it's trying to find a numerical gradient to the, to the response function. So I say it like that, and then we can follow uh, the prediction as it gets better, as it starts manipulating these numbers here. Uh, it's pretty clear that this won't match all data. And uh, this is kind of the, one of the purposes of this demonstration. When you have real data that you work with, there is no guarantee that it really will um, work super well. Uh, it all depends on the real, real data that you have, right? Um, so this, this is uh, chewing along here. The error has gone from 60% error, which is tremendously bad, down to less than 50, which is still tremendously bad, but it's not as bad anymore. Um, so what I will do is down to 40 now. One, one thing that one can try in a case like this, where there really isn't possible to get all of this is to say, well, my foam that I care about is really going to be seeing mostly compression. So I'm not even going to try to ca calibrate this to both tension and compression. I know they won't work. So I'm going to just turn off the tension data and calibrate this model now to compression only. And uh, perhaps we have a better chance to fit the data if that's what we do. So uh, I, I did that. We'll see there's another thing while well, this is running, we can talk a little bit about it. Um, the confined compression, it rolls over, like it has this different modulus and then it becomes slightly less stiff. The tangent stiffness changes here. And that's something that this type of foam model can't do. It's very hard to, to achieve that. It's a different mechanism to causing that. So the, you, you're probably gonna have a hard time getting that to work for you. Um, We'll see now the error looks pretty good, but we, we don't have a good prediction of both the confined compression and the uniaxial compression. I wonder though if I set this up incorrectly. So I'm going to stop this. So this is something that's good to take a look at sometimes. I'm just going to make sure that this load case is indeed confined compression. So I'm going to go here, loading mode. It is confined compression. Wonderful. I was afraid that it was uh, just uh, uniaxial compression. Uh, so I, I think we can continue running this. And uh, we'll see what it comes out of it. Um, the, the other thing that's important here is to, to realize uh, that we have four compression tests and one confined compression. And when it's trying to find the parameters to match this data the best, uh, since there are more tests of the confined compression type, it will emphasize that because the, the error that it minimizes is the average error of all experiments. And that clearly is not so good now because we have four of these and one of these. So to, to make the, the confined compression as important as the other tests that we just happen to have more repeats of, one could uh, simply remove some of these or one can change the, the fitness weight of this one. So I'm going to change this from a weight factor of one, which is the default to four. 
So this one now is four times more important than it was before. So it, it will have this, carry the same weight as these four combined. We'll see if that allows us to uh, work with this a little better. Um, but I, the other thing to remember though when we run these calibrations is that um, we are using a very slow calibration procedure to, to, that keeps the ratio of these parameters relatively close. So I think we could speed this up by changing the optimization algorithm as well. And um, we'll see if, if, um, if that helps here. But it, it is kind of moving around a little bit here. So I'm still curious to see how this will go. I think the beta parameters needs to be much higher. I think that's what's going to save this calibration for us. Um, so I'm going to just try that. See if that works. Instead of 0 0.3, let's make it 1. Ooh, that was too much, of course, right? So, okay. Let's make it 0 0.5. This is something I guess you shouldn't be messing too much with. You may want to let the software do it. Um, so we can let this run out if we want, but I think I, I can uh, jump over to my answer as well. I think I have a, a solution to this that I already saved. So I'm going to open that one. I'm going to save us a little bit of time here. Here is my calibration organ form compression only when I rerun this. And here, here is my uh, saved version of it. And you see, when I just picked uh, um, this and let it run longer, the error get went down to 7%. And it's a little bit better here now uh, in, in the confined compression prediction. It looks actually pretty good. It has an error of less than 1%. We do have a problem with the unaxial compression. It's, it's not quite right. Um, but that's kind of the name of the game that you would have to play with, uh, with this kind of foam models. They don't um, always uh, work as well as you like because the foam materials can be very complicated in the response. Uh, and that's, that's kind of the nature of this. So you would have to run more experiments, try it out, and pick, pick the best uh, material model and the parameter based on the application that you're mostly interested in. Um, I want to end with, with talking about a different type of material model. Well, let's actually try one thing here first, and that is, so here's our ho um, hyper Ogden foam model, right? It looks pretty good, one could say, but the question is, how does this foam model behave in, in another loading mode? So I want to demonstrate that by picking, um, adding some virtual tests, so three different tension load cases at one strain, tension loading modes, I should say, at one strain rate. So I added those here. I'm going to add uh, also the corresponding compression tests. So I added six different virtual tests. So I'm going to turn these off. And I have this calibrated material model. Now I can see, what would this material model do under these conditions? Uniaxial tension, plane strain tension, biaxial tension. Well, we see that this Ogden foam model is independent of loading mode intention. See, the other three curves are pretty much on top of each other. But in compression, they're very different. And this is clearly concerning, right? There is no guarantee that this is right. This is, again, back to the, the comment I made earlier. You need to make sure you have enough experimental data to, to work with this Ogden type foam models. Um, but here it is. And you can really quickly explore that using M calibration. Um, the last thing here, as I wanted to get to, is, is a different material model. And that is a parallel network model that is a built-in feature of the PolyU mod library. And that's going to run it first and we'll take a look. This is a, a, a different material model that allows you to have different stiffnesses in tension and compression. It's a very versatile and much more important, uh, powerful model in this case. You, you can see here the error for all of this is down to 11%. Pretty good uh, overall, actually. And uh, what is this material model? What is this that I'm just plotting here? Well, let's take a look at the material model. It is defined as a polyumod uh, parallel model. So clicking on this icon will show us the structure of the model that's built here. It's a hyper foam model with different tension and compression behaviors. And then it has a little bit of viscous flow in parallel to this one. So it's a, a, a little more advanced model than the ones we just talked about. And if you are interested in how this particular hyperform with different tension and compression stiffnesses, you should check out the PolyUmod user's manual. We talk about all the equations for that. Um, 
but this is uh, looking like this and it, it can be very useful for foam specifically that's why i developed this model where you have this asymmetry between tension and compression and shear where the basic models can't always predict all of that so um, that's really all I, I wanted to show here uh, about these high perform models um, they, they work really well they're very quick to use in real simulations but they do require two things and this is the final comment here first you need a very uh, substantial amount of experimental data you need tension you need compressions typically you need I would prefer shear, perhaps biaxial. You need a lot of data of different kinds to make sure that your model is stable and, and accurate and unique for the particular form you're interested in. So that's the first thing. The second thing is uh, you need to be a little careful when you calibrate it. Think about which parameters should be positive, which should be negative. And I think I tried to cover that here. So with that, I um, hope this was useful for you. And head over to polymerfm.com if you have any questions. Thanks.